This morning we're thinking about the power of God exerted in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first passage I want to turn to is actually Matthew, uh, Matthew 22, verse 23. It's on page 828. Just a couple of verses here to start us off with. Matthew 22, verse 23, page 828. The same day Sadducees came to him, that came to Jesus, who say there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question. And we don't, won't go into the question. The question, the question is, is though challenging uh, the very uh, existence of such a thing as a resurrection from the dead. Verse 29 is the beginning of Jesus' answer. Jesus answered them, You are wrong because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. So the Sadducees were a, a, a Jewish group back in the first century, and one of the things they, they believed, or rather didn't believe, was they didn't believe there was such a thing as the resurrection from the dead. The Pharisees did, the, the Sadducees didn't. They also didn't believe in the full canon of the Old Testament as we have it. They just believed in the first five verses. But the particular thing we're thinking about is the fact they didn't believe in the resurrection. And what is Jesus' answer? Jesus' answer is, you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. We need to know the power of God then. We need to know that God has the power to raise the dead. Physically, literally, that's what we're talking about on Easter Sunday. That's what we celebrate. Some people who profess the name of Christian have said that, oh, Jesus rose again in a sort of spiritual way. I mean, there have been bishops that have said that. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible said Jesus rose from the dead so you could touch him, so you could eat him, see, watch him eat fish. He's physically raised from the dead. But that's the power we're talking about this morning. So we need to know the power of God that has this power to raise the dead. And so this, this fact of Jesus' resurrection confronts us this morning. It confronts non-believers with the need to believe. And it confronts believers with the power that saves them. In actual fact, once we do come to know and believe in the power of God, then actually it's, it's not at all difficult, in a sense, to believe in the resurrection. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul in Acts 26 verse 8 says, what is, Why is it thought incredible that God raises the dead? If God is God, then raising the dead is no problem to him, surely. That's the definition of God. That's the definition of the power of God. Christ has been raised, and that's what we're thinking about this morning. Christ has been raised, it says in Romans. Christ has been raised by the glory of the Father. So blessed are those who have not seen him and yet have believed. Now, Christians are those who trust not in their own power and ability, but trust in God's power. That's the very definition of Christian faith. Not to trust in ourselves, but to trust in God and his power. So as we're thinking about the power of God exerted in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, we're thinking about something that goes to the very heart of what the Christian faith is. Reliance not on ourselves. Emptying ourselves of all self-reliance, but relying on God and his power, the power of that raises the dead. In fact, God ordains our circumstances so that we rely on him. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. It's on page 964. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Here the Apostle Paul is talking autobiographically about his own experiences and experiences of those with him. And listen to what he says in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, 2 Corinthians, page 964. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we have received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. You see, Paul and these others were suffering almost unbearable burdens and difficulties. But, as the Apostle Paul testifies here, and he's testifying as an Apostle of Christ, in other words, with authority, Paul here testifies that this was, all these sufferings were to make them rely not on themselves, but on God who raises the dead. 
Now, might that actually speak helpfully to some of you here who've been going through various struggling struggles and difficulties and circumstances uh, that you just are puzzled by and, and, and you're, you're believers and you wonder why, why does the Lord let these things happen? Well, I hope you will find this helpful this morning to have God set before you in his awesome power that raised Christ from the dead because that's what we need. We need to have reliance not on ourselves but out, out of ourselves onto him, onto Christ and the God who raised him. That's what we need. Isn't that what we need? We need to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so at last, in such a manner, to attain the resurrection of the dead. So the whole Christian walk, the whole Christian faith, is uh, walking through this, going through this life, trusting in a power outside of ourselves, trusting in the power of God in Christ, trusting in the power of Christ's resurrection. And doing that through the weakness and difficulties that we go through in this world. We do experience answers to prayer in this world. We do experience the Lord. But we also experience great problems and, and issues that crop up and seem to get worse before they get better. Well, this is so that we rely not on ourselves. That, that God has designed these things. This isn't an accident even. God has designed these things so that we... So that we lose and dissolve all our self-reliance and rather rely on the one who has the power to raise the dead and to give eternal life. So that's the path of Christian faith, to rely on Christ and his great power through difficulties and so to reach the glory of the world to come. Now, we're going to look at some passages of Romans this morning. So turn with me, if you will, to Romans. Romans chapter 1 is on page 939. And we're going to look at some passages in Romans on this theme of the power of God being exerted in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And we're going to see the gospel here. And we're going to put that in front of us, as it were, to help us to build believers up and to confront non-believers with. This is what we need to know about. This is what we need to hear. So let me start off by reading Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. This is a great summary of the gospel that is about to be unfolded in this longest of Paul's letters, which is, which is the longest single stretch of explanation of what the gospel is. And here's a little summary of it here. And listen up for the word power. The apostle writes this, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Do you see how the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes? This great letter is going to expand how the gospel, the good news of the Christian message, the Bible's message, is all of grace. It is all a free gift. All of God's work. In chapter 11, verse 36, having explained this, the apostle writes this, it is from him, through him, and to him are all things. The gospel is from God. He designed it. He, he thought of it. It's through him. He puts it into practice, he, he, he implements it, he, he works it, he produces it. And it's to him, it's to his glory. So these summary verses here in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, they speak of the gospel being the power of God for salvation. What is the basis of that statement? What, I mean, anyone can say anything about power. It's easy to talk about power, but where's the power that Paul's thinking about as he writes this? Well, this is not the first time he's mentioned power, even though we're still in chapter 1. He's already mentioned power, in verse 4. And that power is the power that raised Christ from the dead. Let me just read verses 1 to 4. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God, in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So it's in raising Christ from the dead that God exerts his power to save, which is what this is about and this whole letter of Romans is going to be about. And the whole Bible's about. 
the power of God to save. Now, much of Romans is about how God in the gospel does a mighty work of producing righteousness, a righteousness that is counted to us and received by faith. And so we see that mentioned here, verse 17. For in it, in the gospel, a righteousness of God is revealed that is from faith for faith. And as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so this is speaking here of the righteousness of God that is revealed in the gospel, that's made known, and that is entirely received by faith. In other words, we receive it as a gift, something we don't work up ourselves. It's something given. The old theologians talked about it as an alien righteousness. In other words, not a righteousness of my own. Not a, not a righteousness that I sort of muster up myself by my good deeds and try and present myself to God uh, clothed in my own good deeds, as it were, saying, accept me on the basis of how I've lived. No! It's, it's not that at all. It's completely the opposite of that. This righteousness that is, this letter is about, is about a righteousness that is given now, in fact, every other spiritual blessing a believer has is built on this foundation of their justification. I always think justification is a little bit of a boring word for a wonderful thing. Uh, it sounds very technical, doesn't it? It's about being accepted before God. And so on the basis of one's justification, one has other things. So having been justified by faith, it says in chapter 5, verse 1, we have peace with God, reconciled with God, adopted as God's children, the hope of glory. It's all piled up, piled up upon our justification before God, upon what, on what basis am I accepted by God as righteous? And so this alien righteousness, this righteousness that is not our own, that is not worked by us, that's not produced by our own works, this alien righteousness is what the gospel's about. And it's what believers stand wonderfully clothed in before God, fit for his holy presence. And it's produced by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead. Turn with me to chapter 4. Chapter 4. We're going to join it right at the end of the chapter. Verses 22 to 25. Here the apostle's been talking about Abraham and his faith and how he was justified by faith, how he was counted righteous just by believing God's word. And so we join it at verse 22. That is why his, Abraham's faith, was counted to him as righteousness. That comes in Genesis, Genesis 15 verse 6. But the words, it was counted to him, it was counted to Abraham, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It righteousness that is, will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. Righteousness will be counted to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Do you see there, the last verse, how Christ died for our sins. We thought about that on Good Friday, if you were here, and maybe you went to another Bible-believing church where they taught that as well. Christ died for our sins. That was the purpose behind the cross. And there's a purpose to his resurrection as well. He was raised for our justification. So that this mighty declaration of Christ's righteousness, which happens as he's raised from the dead, is also counted to us who believe in him. We likewise are counted righteous as a pure free gift. So think of it in the light of Good Friday. At the cross, the Lord had all our sins loaded onto him. We saw that from Isaiah 53. The Lord uh, laid on him the iniquity, the offenses, the sin of us all. So Christ on the cross is bearing all the weight of the sin of his people, all, their, all the guilt of it, for him to pay the penalty. And then see how three days later, on Easter Sunday, Christ is then manifestly declared righteous by his resurrection. Now our sins, which were laid on Christ, were never taken off him. They never fell off him, as it were. Our sins are still imputed to Christ. There's still as much on Christ as on us. In fact, we might say more so. 
They were never taken off him. He paid for them. So if he on, on whom our sins were laid is now declared righteous, and that's manifestly so because he's been raised from the dead, then how powerfully we too, who believe in Christ, are declared righteous too. Do you see it? Christ bears all our sin. He bears all our sin on the cross. He goes to the grave. He's, he's raised again. No one's taken his, our sin away from him. He's raised again because he's paid for our sin. And so if he is declared righteous, then you and I who believe in him are likewise declared righteous. Do you see the power of God in this? The power of God. In Jeremiah 23 verse 6, Christ is given this title, the Lord our righteousness. And Jesus comes into that title on Easter Sunday as he's raised from the dead. He becomes the Lord our righteousness as he's raised from the dead. And I've just found that so helpful recently. It's lifted me out of myself. It shows me what I am by the power of Christ. God accepts me as righteous. I mean, if you knew what I'm like, if you knew my past, my mind, you would not think I'm righteous and you'd be right. But I know that there is the Lord my righteousness. And you, if you're a believer, you know that too. You know that there is one in heaven, Jesus Christ at God's right hand, who is your righteousness, who became your righteousness as, you, as he was raised from the dead, as you put your faith in him. It's just so helpful. I, I've literally laughed out loud recently thinking about this, the, the Lord our righteousness. Literally, I'm, I'm, literally. It's just so amazing and wonderful. The reality of it, the joy of it. This is the power of God for our salvation. And when we think about these things, when we do, God often grants us to, to feel the power of it in our own souls and to have a felt sense of how one's salvation depends entirely not on oneself, but on another, on Christ. That is such a joy. Let's look at Romans chapter 10. I think this is the last passage we're looking at, Romans 10. I'm going to read verses 1 to 10 and just listen for the same themes as they come up. Brothers, this is Apostle Paul writing, he's a Jew. As he writes about his brothers, he means his fellow Jews. Brothers, my heart's desire is, uh, and prayer to God for them is that they, his fellow Jews, may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that, a person, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down? Or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now this passage contrasts a man-made righteousness with a God-made righteousness. A man-made righteousness is, is useless. Uh, it's not because the law of God is useless, it's because we're sinners and we can't keep God's law. Ever since we've been expelled from the Garden of Eden, we've never been able to keep God's law. And so verse 5, Moses writes about the righteousness based on the law, that a person, the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But as Paul has shown earlier in the letter, the problem is that we are unable to keep, keep God's law. But that hasn't stopped many people trying to be acceptable to God by their own works. Verse 3, for example, talks about that. But it can only fail. It's no good. We cannot muster up a goodness that God finds acceptable. We just cannot do it. But through the gospel, there is a proper righteousness, this alien righteousness that theologians talk about, the righteousness that God has made by raising Jesus from the dead, the one who bore our sin. 
Now, for many years, I don't know if you, as I read, read verses 6 and 7, I don't know if they were confusing to you as it talks about, uh, do not say in your heart uh, who, will, uh, uh, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down and so on. And have you ever found that confusing? I've found that confusing for the last 52 years. But then I think suddenly it made sense to me this week. Will it be sensible to think that we have the power and ability to bring Christ down from heaven? That's what happened at Christmas time. Christ came down from heaven. We didn't bring him there, did we? God sent him. God sent Christ. Do we have the power to, to, to make the Son of God incarnate as one of us? No, we don't, do we? What about raising Christ from the dead? Do we, you and I have the power to raise Christ from the dead? We don't, do we? That's right, we don't. We don't have that power. And so that, in essence, is, is what a person is trying to do who's trying to establish their own righteousness before God and come to God and say, I'm good enough. It's like saying, I've got the power to bring your son down from heaven and make him man. I've got the power to raise him from the grave and give him life after he's been crucified. Do we have that power? We don't have that power. But God does. God has got that power. And so we put our faith in God who has that power. And we forget, we abandon all foolish thoughts that we've got the power to do this ourselves. So verses 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Isn't that wonderful? It is so simple. This is, this is just preaching to us a simple, humble faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour risen from the dead. You may have led a terrible life. You may have done crime upon crime and got in trouble with the police. You may have led a relatively respectable life, but done all sorts of things that you'd rather people don't know about, and you've thought some things that you hope God doesn't know about. God knows about all those things. But do you see here there is a righteousness produced by the power of God, a righteousness that only God's power can produce, that we receive just by taking hold of it as a free gift. Because it's been produced by God's power, we don't contribute anything to it. We just receive it for ourselves. And so this undercuts any self-reliance that we may have. And says, no, abandon all self-reliance. And so the message at the heart of the gospel is just so liberating. It says, I cannot produce the righteousness God requires. I cannot. But God can. And I see it there produced in the gospel. God has done that. And so I just need to humbly and simply trust in Jesus Christ, and receive his righteousness as a free gift. It's a message we each need to hear. Because if we have put our trust in Christ, then we need to have that trust built up. We need to hear this. This message is life and health for us. Because so easily we, we turn from the things we cannot see to the things we can see, and in particular ourselves, and we start to rely on ourselves again. And so that's why God sends difficulties into our lives so that to, to, to stop us relying on ourselves and to get us relying on him and his power and the gospel and the Lord Jesus. So we need to, believers need to hear this. We need to be reminded of the, the one who has the, the power to raise the dead and that that's what he did to produce our salvation for us and to trust in him alone. And the evidence of that is the resurrection. And we need to be reminded of this again and again so that the mighty power of Christ's righteousness is what we trust in and our foolish thoughts about self-reliance are, are, are taken away and, and, and got rid of. And for any who have not put their trust in Christ, and there may well be more than one person here this morning for whom that is the case, for any who have not put their trust in Christ, then to hear this gospel message is to hear the call to the only hope there is for acceptance with God. You cannot save yourself. I cannot save myself. But God who sent Christ down and raised Christ up can save you. Now we've just looked at one aspect of the power of Christ's resurrection. There are so many we could have looked at. In Acts 17 it's that he's the judge of all the world. Christ is the judge that we all have to stand in front of. 
So do you see, in the power of of Christ's resurrected greatness, he is both the judge of all and he is the supreme gift of righteousness for all who will trust in him. Would you want to die and face Christ's awesome power without first being clothed in his righteousness? We wouldn't want that. And so if you've never trusted in Christ, let me ask you this morning, will you not take this free gift that is being offered to you? Will you not receive it for yourself just with humble faith? Just confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe Christ raised him from the dead. It's as simple as that. And and God accepts you as righteous as Christ. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the power of the gospel. For those who believe this, there's no condemnation. God justifies them. Christ died for them. Christ was raised for them. So may the preaching this morning cause us to abandon all other hopes. May it cause us to get rid of anything else that we're trusting in, and especially ourselves, and invest all our hopes, all our trust in the power of God at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you have exerted power that no other can. Who else can raise the dead? And you raised Christ. We praise you for this historical fact. And we pray that you just help us to take in its great significance. It confronts us with your power. It confronts us with your power to judge the world and your power to save those who trust in him. Oh, Heavenly Father, would you produce saving faith in those that lack it? Would you bring people to new birth in Christ this morning? That is again an exercise of the power that you exerted in Christ when you raised him from the dead. Will you exert that? Will you do that amongst us this morning? Would you cause people to turn and renounce all hope in themselves and come as a self-confessed sinner to you and to trust in the provision that you have made in the death and resurrection of your Son. Oh, Heavenly Father, would you glorify Christ today in our midst? Would he be great in our minds and souls as we go home from this place? Would he be the encouragement of every believer's heart? We pray these things then in his name. Amen.